Then he's got some Bibles in the back. Just raise up your hand and we'll give you a copy of God's Word. And if you haven't, uh, you can turn to James chapter 5, verses 13. We've been doing a series on prayer. And uh, we're actually coming back to James. I held this part of James back as we started our series on prayer. We wanted to talk about why we pray. Then we talked about how we pray. When Jesus was asked by his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And John taught his disciples to pray. And so uh, we we're looking at those two things. And now I want to come back to James. And I want to talk to you about the blessing of trouble. And let me just ask you, is anybody right now currently going through a problem in their life, they've got trouble in their life, there's something in their life that's on their heart that um, they just need God to come and intercede for. Is that just me? Anybody else uh, going through situations in their life? Yeah, we all have situations that we go through that cause us troubles in our life. And it says simply this in James 5.13, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Now, something kind of interesting has uh, taken place. And uh, as my uh, sermon points have gotten shorter, my sermons have actually gotten longer. So I don't know uh, exactly what's happening there, but the uh, sermons seem to get a little bit longer and the points are getting shorter. I'm sure one time I'll start preaching sermons with no point at all. I don't know. But uh, we're going to look at... Uh, James 5.13, where uh, we deal with, is any one of us in trouble that he should pray? And I want to look, first of all, that prayer draws us close to God in times of trouble. Now, most of you know the uh, fictional character, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Well, there was a time when uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were camping and uh, they took, went out there, they set their tent, they built a campfire, they had dinner, they re retired for the evening. And in the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes was awakened. And so he elbowed Dr. Watson and he said, Watson, look up, what do you see? And Watson looked up and he says, well, I see thousands and thousands of stars. And he says, what does that tell you? And so he said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions and millions of galaxies surrounded by billions and billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Horizontally, it tells me that it's about a quarter past three. Meteorologically, it shows me that Tomorrow should be a great day. And theologically, it tells me that God is great. He's the creator of the universe. And we are just small, small parts of his creation. And Watson said to Holmes, well, what does it tell you? And Holmes was silent for a second. And he said, Watson, you idiot. It tells us that our tent has been stolen. <laughs> now, I share that little story with you because sometimes we miss... The obvious. James says, is there any among you that is in trouble? He should pray. Now that seems obvious, but what happens when we are in trouble in our life? When crisis happens in our life? Usually we become anxious. We panic. We worry. We have anxiety. We're pushing the panic button, and the thing that we're supposed to do first, the thing that should be the most obvious to us to pray and to call out to God, is one of the things that often is the last thing that we do. Now, trouble tells us more about our relationship with God than almost anything else. Trouble feels like a crisis that must be solved immediately. And so we get into panic mode. And instead of the prayer mode that we should be in, 
We step on the gas when really we should be putting on the brakes. Now, I heard a definition of panic, and this is the definition that I heard, that when you floor it to go through the yellow light and the guy in front of you slams on the brakes, that's when panic begins. Uh, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but uh, that creates panic. And a lot of times when we should be praying, instead we panic and we become anxious. There's no peace in our heart. And so we go into that panic mode. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about Daniel, Noah, and Job, three great men of God. And I want us to look at, if you want to turn to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, how did Daniel handle trouble in his life? It is a crisis that may come up in our life, and Daniel, he models what we should do. Trouble is a defining moment that may happen in our life. And in the Bible, it is really a how-to book. This isn't just a book about theology. It's not a book about things that we can kind of look at and understand. It shows us how we should live, how we should respond to situations in our life. And when I look at the Bible, I want to look at how do I respond to things that are taking place in my life? How should I respond? Well, Daniel is a great model of how to respond in difficult situations. And he was taken from Israel into Babylon, into captivity. He was appointed in the school where he would become an advisor to King Nebuchadnezzar, one of the wise men. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He wanted his wise men to tell him the dream and then to interpret the dream. But he wasn't going to tell them what the dream was. Nobody could do it. So he decided to kill all his wise men and start over. And since he was a king and he could do whatever he wanted, he just gave the order. And so they were coming to find Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 14, it says that Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, and I'm in verse 15 right now, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends may not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So we see what Daniel did. He asked for time. He went back. He got his friends. And they had a prayer meeting. They began to plead to God for the answer for the trouble that was facing them. They had a single-mindedness in their prayer. That's one of the things that trouble does in our life. It creates a single-mindedness because of the crisis that we may be going through. Without trouble in our life, you know, our prayer life and our spiritual life and a lot of things in our life can kind of become boring. You know, our prayer, I, now I lay me to sleep here. You ever pray those prayers and you're just kind of going through the motions of prayer, going through the motions of your walk with God. And then a crisis comes in your life and now God's got your attention. Now God has got your undivided uh, attention focus back on Him. And so Daniel and his friends who were about to be executed, God had their attention and they pleaded and asked God for help. It says this in Jeremiah 29.12. Now we often quote Jeremiah 29.11 where it says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, 
plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then it goes on in the very next verse, in verse 12, and it says, Then you will come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me, and you will find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, you shall be found by me, declares the Lord. When you search for me, with all of your heart, then you will be found by me, declares the Lord. And usually it takes a crisis in our life. Usually there's a trouble spot in our life that gets our undivided attention, that we begin to wholeheartedly seek after God, and then he comes and intervenes. There is a bond that you feel in battle. The band of brothers. Whenever you go through something together, whether it's at work, whether it's in sports, it's a common bond. Uh, often the most high, high level uh, part of that would be in war. That band of brothers idea where you're going through something intense and you just feel a kinship. You feel a relationship as you're going through and you get to the other side of that battle. Well, you know what? That is the same bond that God wants to have with us when we go into battle with Him and we get to the other side. There is a bonding that takes place in our relationship with God, that He is not far off, that He is not a distant God, but you have experienced a closeness to Him, a relationship with Him. God says in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, He says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you're going to go through a difficult time in your life, God has promised, I will be with you. And when God is with you in those times of battle, when those times of testing, there is a presence. I remember when I first got saved, the, the very first thing I felt from the Lord as I asked Him to come into my life within uh, either that time or within a few days, I knew that I would never be alone again. I knew that God was always going to be with me. And as I look back on the past 30 years, that impression is absolutely true. I've never really felt alone because God's Spirit is with me. Never really thought about it much over the past 30 years, but as I reflect on that and think about that, wow, isn't that something incredible? Just knowing that whatever you go through, that God is with you. If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't know what troubles that you're going through in your life today, but I can tell you, I don't know how people who don't have the Lord in their life are going through it because it is difficult enough for me as a born again, washed in the blood believer to go through the trials that I go through and I couldn't do it without the Lord. And as Bill's saying, I need you more, more than words can say. There's something about the trials that we go through, the troubles that we go through,